The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger. Chapter 8. It was too late to call up for a cab or anything, so I walked the whole way to the station. It wasn't too far, but it was cold as hell, and the snow made it hard for walking. My gladstones kept banging hell out of my legs. I sort of enjoyed the air and all, though, I mean, the only trouble was the cold made my nose hurt right up under my lip where an old strat ladder laid one on me. He'd smacked my lip right on my teeth, and it was pretty sore. My ears were nice and warm, though. That hat I bought had ear laps in it, and I put them on. I didn't give a damn how I looked. Nobody was around anyway. Everybody was in the sack. I was quite lucky when I got to the station, because I only had to wait about ten minutes for a train. While I waited, I got some snow in my hand and washed my face with it. I still had quite a bit of blood on Usually, I like riding on trains, especially at night, with the lights on and the windows so black and one of those guys coming up the aisle and selling coffee and sandwiches and magazines. I usually buy a ham sandwich and about four magazines. If I'm on a train at night, I can usually even read one of those dumb stories in a magazine without puking. You know, one of those stories with a lot of phony lean jawed guys named David in it and a lot of phony girls named Linda or Marsha that are always lighting all the goddamn David's pipes for them. I can even read one of those lousy stories on a train at night usually but this time it was different. I just didn't feel like it. I just sort of sat and not did anything. All I did was take off my hunting hat and put it in my pocket. All of a sudden this lady got on at Trenton and sat down next to me Practically, the whole car was empty because it was pretty late and all, but she sat down next to me instead of an empty seat because she had this big bag with her and I was sitting in the front seat. She stuck the bag right out in the middle of the aisle where the conductor and everybody could trip over it. She had these orchids on like she'd just been to a big party or something. She was around 40 or 45, I guess, but she was very good looking. Women kill me. They really do. I don't mean I'm oversexed or anything like that, although I am quite sexy, I just like them, I mean. They're always leaving their goddamn bags out in the middle of the aisle. Anyway, we were sitting there, and all of a sudden she said to me, Excuse me, but isn't that a Pensy Prep sticker? She was looking at my suitcases up on the rack. Yes, it is, I said. She was right. I did have a goddamn Pensy sticker on one of my Gladstones. Very corny, I'll admit. Oh, do you go to Pensy, she said. She had a nice voice, a nice telephone voice, mostly. She should have carried a goddamn telephone around with her. Yes, I do, I said. Oh, how lovely. Perhaps you know my son, then, Ernest Morrow. He goes to Pensy. Yes, I do. He's in my class. Her son was doubtless the biggest bastard that ever went to Pensy in the whole crummy history of the school. He was always going down the corridor after he had a shower, snapping his soggy old wet towel at people's asses. That's exactly the kind of a guy he was. Oh, how nice, the lady said, but not corny. She was just nice and all. I must tell Ernest we met, she said. May I ask your name, dear? Rudolf Schmidt, I told her. I didn't feel like giving her my whole life story. Rudolf Schmidt was the name of the janitor of our dorm. Do you like Pensy? She asked me. Pensy? It's not too bad. It's not paradise or anything, but it's as good as most schools. Some of the faculty are pretty conscientious. Ernest just adores it. I know he does, I said. Then I started shooting the old crap around a little bit. He adapts himself very well to things. He really does. I mean, he really knows how to adapt himself. Do you think so? She asked me. She sounded interested as hell. Ernest? Sure, I said. Then I watched her take off of her gloves. Boy, was she lousy with rocks. I just broke a nail getting out of a cab, she said. She looked up at me and sort of smiled. She had a terrifically nice smile. She really did. Most people have hardly any smile at all or a lousy one. Ernest's father and I sometimes worry about him, she said. We sometimes feel he's not a terribly good mixer. How do you mean? Well, he's a very sensitive boy. He's really never been a terribly good mixer with other boys. Perhaps he takes things a little bit more seriously than he should at this age. Sensitive. That killed me. That guy Morrow was about as sensitive as a goddamn toilet seat. I gave her a look. 
she didn't look like any dope to me. She looked like she might have a pretty damn good idea what a bastard she was the mother of. But you can't always tell with somebody's mother. I mean, mothers are all slightly insane. The thing is, though, I liked old Morrow's mother. She was all right. Would you care for a cigarette? I asked her. She looked all around. I don't believe this is a smoker, Rudolph, she said. <laughs> Rudolph, that killed me. That's all right. We can smoke till they start screaming at us, I said. She took a cigarette off me and I gave her a light. She looked nice smoking. She inhaled and all, but she didn't wolf the smoke down the way most women around her age do. She had a lot of charm. She had quite a lot of sex appeal too, if you really want to know. She was looking at me sort of funny. I mean, I may be wrong, but I believe your nose is bleeding, dear, she said all of a sudden. I nodded and took out my handkerchief. I got hit with a snowball, I said. One of those very icy ones. I probably would have told her what really happened, but it would have taken too long. I liked her, though. I was beginning to sort of feel sorry that I told her that my name was Rudolph Schmidt. Old Ernie, I said. He's one of the most popular boys at Pensy. Did you know that? No, I didn't. I nodded. It really took everybody quite a long time to get to know him. He's a funny guy. A strange guy in lots of ways. Know what I mean? Like, when I first met him, when I first met him, I thought he was a kind of snobbish person. That's what I thought. But he isn't. He's just got this very original personality that takes you a while to get to know him. Old Mrs. Morrow didn't say anything, but boy, you should have seen her. I had her glued to her seat. You take somebody's mother and all they want to hear about is what a hot shot their son is. And then I really started chucking the old crap around. Did he tell you about the elections? I asked her. The class elections? She shook her head. I had her in a trance like I really did. Well, a bunch of us wanted old Ernie to be president of the class. I mean, he was the unanimous choice. I mean, he was the only boy that could really handle the job. I said, boy, I was shucking it. But this other boy, Harry Fencer, was elected. And the reason he was elected, the simple and obvious reason, was because Ernie wouldn't let us nominate him. Because he's so darn shy and modest and all. He refused. Boy, he's really shy. You ought to make him try to get over that. I looked at her. Didn't he tell you about it? No, he didn't. I nodded. That's Ernie. He wouldn't. That's the one fault with him. He's too shy and modest. You really ought to get him to try to relax occasionally. Right that minute, the conductor came around for old Mrs. Morrow's ticket, and it gave me a chance to quit shooting it. I'm glad I shot it for a while, though. You take a guy like Morrow that's always snapping their towel at people's asses, really trying to hurt somebody with it. They don't just stay a rat while they're a kid. They stay a rat their whole life. But I'll bet, after all that crap I shot... Mrs. Morrow will keep thinking of him now as this very shy, modest guy that wouldn't let us nominate him for president. She might. You can't tell. Mothers aren't too sharp about that stuff. Would you care for a cocktail? I asked her. I was feeling in the mood for one myself. We can go in the club car. All right? Dear, are you allowed to order drinks? She asked me. Not snotty, though. She was too charming and all to be snotty. Well, no, not exactly, but... I can usually get them on account of my height, I said, and uh, I have quite a bit of gray hair. I turned sideways and showed her my gray hair. It fascinated the hell out of her. Come on, join me. Why don't you? I said, I'd have enjoyed having her. I really don't think I'd better. Thank you so much, though, dear, she said. Anyway, the club car's mostly likely closed. It's quite late, you know. She was right. I had forgotten all about what time it was. And then she looked at me and asked me what I was afraid she was going to ask me. Ernest wrote that he'd be home on Wednesday, that Christmas vacation would start on Wednesday, she said. I hope you weren't called home suddenly because of illness in the family. She looked quite worried about it. She wasn't just being nosy, you could tell. No, everybody's fine at home, I said. It's me. I have to have this operation. Oh, I'm so sorry, she said. She really was, too. I was right away sorry I'd said it, but it was too late. It isn't very serious. I have this little this little tumor on the brain. Oh, no. She put her hand up to her mouth and all. I'll, I'll be all right and everything. It, it's right near the outside. And it's a very tiny one. They can take it out in about two minutes. Then I started reading this timetable I had in my pocket just to stop lying. 
once I get started, I can go on for hours if I feel like it. No kidding. Hours. We didn't talk too much after that. She started reading this Vogue that she had with her, and I looked out the window for a while. She got off at Newark. She wished me a lot of luck with the operation and all. She kept calling me Rudolph. And then she invited me to visit Ernie during the summer at Gloucester, Massachusetts. She said that her house was right on the beach, and they had a tennis court and all. But I just thanked her and told her that I was going to South America with my grandmother, which was really a hot one because my grandmother hardly even goes out of the house except maybe to go to a goddamn matinee or something. But I wouldn't visit that son of a bitch Morrow for all of the dough in the world, even if I was desperate. 